Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. And hey, friends, I'm Lee Brown, and you're listening to or watching Crazy Shit in Real Estate, and I'm glad you came back to the show again. If you're listening to this on iTunes, don't forget we flipped over to YouTube earlier this year for those of y'all that like to look at faces and virtual backgrounds. And actually, Joe and I both have real backgrounds today, so it's a pretty special day here on Crazy Shit. And today I'm bringing y'all somebody who does a lot of work in the real estate space, bringing people together, and he's also an investor, and he's also been a realtor, and so he's all over the place. And he's currently coming to us from one of his properties in Louisiana. So Joe Sesso, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Lee. Thanks for having me. For you listeners on the podcast, you can't see that he's wearing an LSU shirt. And I'm just going to remind you, Joe, that the last time Carolina, my Tar Heels were in the College World Series, we did beat LSU and it was a really happy day. And that's the only sport that I need to come back, frankly, is college baseball and overall the pro sports right now. But I need college baseball to come back because we are, of course, filming this during the remaining dregs of the pandemic era. So, Joe, tell our listeners a little bit about who you are, what your background is, where you're at, any of the things they need to know about Joe. Yeah. Hey, so I grew up in Chicago. That's where I'm born and raised. Got my real estate license in 2000. So same year, I think you got it, right, Lee? Oh, we're like twins. Got, yeah, got it. Got my license in 2000. And uh, I've still, I have still have an active license in Illinois. I haven't lived in Illinois since 2016. Started off as an agent, represented investors. Then said, hey, I want to be an investor. I became an investor. The Great Recession happened. I was an accidental property manager then for many years. So from there, then I also became, I had a, at that point, it had given me a lot of experience in, in property management, investing, and in real estate in general. Became the national speaker for, for Realtor.com for three years. And then in 2011, I moved over to Homes.com. And that's where I still am to this day. It's nine, nine years later, still, a, still at Homes.com, but also an active, still an active investor and still, like I said, a licensed agent. And I love how you mentioned that accidental landlord. That happened to a lot of people during the Great Recession. And if you're listening to this and you're a newer agent who wasn't around during the years that frankly gave a lot of us some realtor PTSD, and that's not even a joke or a slight at PTSD. It's why a lot of realtors have completely wigged out during the pandemic because it felt so much at the beginning like that recessionary period. But we had a lot of homeowners at that time who were completely underwater because the prices were continuing to spiral down, but they had to move for job or divorce or whatever was going on. They just had to go and they couldn't afford to sell, but maybe they were employed and they couldn't qualify for a short sale. And so they said, well, screw it. We'll just rent it out and see what happens. And so as Joe can attest, we would have people call us once a year. Hey, what's it worth now? What's it worth now? What's it worth now? What's it worth now? Looking for that number to get high enough that they could clear it and get it off their books because they didn't intentionally go into investing. But a lot of the people who wound up accidentally investing turned into actual investors. So Joe, tell us a little bit about the pathway you went into investment real estate. What happened during that recessionary period to you? Before I got my real estate career, I was watching one of those late night infomercials about how to buy real estate. Because Carlton Sheets owns the late night air. You know, Carlton Sheets, it was Carlton Sheets. It actually was a guy, <laughs> Carlton Sheets was one of them. There was another guy out there and he, he was also talking about how you could buy foreclosures, you could buy this and that. So I, I, I read it, I'm like, hey, this, this thing could work. Believe it or not, I found a deal, okay? I was, I, was working, I was working in a health food store, found a great deal and I went to the bank and I said, hey, I've got this investment property I wanna be able to, uh, to buy. It's worth this much. Uh, I, had an, I had a team, I had an agent that gave me the comps. I said, but I can get it for this much. And the bank looked at me like, well, so what experience do you have in real estate? And basically they looked at me like, you have no experience. I can't, I'm sorry. I got it. There's, there's no way that I can, I can just look at these numbers and say, this is going to work. I got denied for the loan. And, and so I said, he, he gave me some advice. He said, my advice to you is this, get a real estate license, become a realtor. And when you come back into with these, with these opportunities, you know, we'll, you'll be taken more seriously, whether it's to me or anybody else. And we're talking about the late nineties now. So I went, got my real estate license, and then I started, basically, I'd go in and I'd use the same methods that I used to find these foreclosure deals. But what I did was I would go to the sellers and say, look, here's your situation. You know, you've got a, it's a pre, it was a pre-foreclosure, they, they call them, and they'd say, I'd say, you've got a, a sheriff's auction coming up on your property in two months. Here are your options. If you let it go, it can go to the highest bidder. However, I can list it for you and sell it and get your top dollar for the property. So I started doing this. 
And people, I started connecting with people and they started saying, wow, you're finding these deals. Then I started, investors started coming to me and I started to put together the investors with the, with the sellers. And then finally I started saying, hey, I want to be a part of this investment team. And so I started buying properties. And so, so I'd buy, I'd hold some, we'd, re- we'd flip some. Well, then comes the, uh, the recession. And, uh, you know, one of those things was when it happens, yeah, it's going, well, we were buying one undervalued to begin with. So we're thinking, okay, we're, we're going to be safe. We've got a cushion in place. And it just kept going down and down and down. And like you said, Lee, it was, it, it, it's, you, could not get a, you could not get a short sale on them because of the fact they were investment properties. They didn't want to do, so they were saying, no, you can't do it. They look at your, your, income state, your income statements and they're saying, no, you know what? You're not at a hardship. We're going to, you have to keep them. And so by doing that, yeah, I had to rent these properties out. And boy, I will tell you, I, I learned a lot about, uh, about property management very fast uh, during that time. So <laughs> every horror story you've probably heard of, I've done it twice. So. Well, and property management has a reputation for being a high headache and low margin part of the business. And it's totally true because if you're an investor with a property manager, if they've got a good tenant, you're paying them for nothing. But the minute you have a rotten tenant, man, you're not paying them nearly enough. It's the wildest seesaw on the planet. But it's about the only backstopper you have against people who know the system better than you do. And a lot of what happens in oddball economic climates is that your tenants figure out very quickly what they can and can't get away with. And one thing that hammered our investors during that time, and Joe, I don't know if you saw this, I'm sure you did, the tenants would make the payment to the investor, but the investor would not pay the mortgage because they're going to go spend it on something else. And their balance sheets looked okay but the bank was not going to help them out because they knew there were shenanigans going on. So it's not always just tenants who don't pay. Sometimes your tenants are honorable and the investor messed them up. In fact, that was in that big short movie. Do you remember yeah, that, I was bring that up. Yeah. Florida, the dad and the kid yep. it was like I'm yeah. crying. I'm ugly crying in that scene. And yep. by the way, y'all, if you, if you never watched the big short or read that book, it's probably the best explainer of what happened in the Great Recession, although it's highly dramatized. I mean, everything is on TV, but it's worth watching. So anyway, Joe, tell us what you saw during some of these situations. Because, you know, at Crazy Shit, we like to hear the things that you could tell us over a glass of bourbon, but we can't sit together right now and have a glass. So tell me these horror stories you've seen. What was the wildest situation that would come to mind or three of the top things you've seen? Well, I'll tell you the wildest one. So the wildest one was uh, was a situation where, now at this point I have, and I'm doing my own self-property management. And in addition to that, I'm also trying to have a real estate career so I'm doing all this stuff. And that's the first lesson I would say is, is, is to delegate that responsibility because the tenants always want to be your friend. And the minute you're friendly to them, you give them an inch, they want, they want a yard. And so in this situation, there was a situation that came up. I had a, a, a multi-unit building, two-unit building in, in Chicago. Father lived on the top floor and his daughter and son-in-law lived on the, on the, on the bottom floor. And so in Chicago, winter is pretty brutal. Uh, and so he, he was having trouble paying his rent. He had just made the payment from the month before. This month comes up and it's, it's, it's a snowstorm. It's February. Now, but the way I wrote my leases was that they were had, the properties were self-managed. So I didn't have a company that came around and did the shoveling or, or did that. It was in the lease where, hey, this is a single family property or if it's a multi-unit that was family um, occupied, that they have to manage their own property. So this guy tells me, he says, oh yeah, hey, listen, my father-in-law uh, was going down the stairs and he slipped and he fell and he's in a coma and he's in the hospital right now. And I just want you to let, let you know that, um, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to be late with the rent this month because we have to, you know, you know, we don't know how much the hospital bills are going to cost. So I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? I'm freaking out. I, I don't know what to do. I didn't want to really, you know, pr- impress it. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm young and naive at this time. I'm like, I didn't, you know, so I, I called oh, my attorney. you still believed him, didn't you? I, I really did. And oh. I called my attorney up and I say, what, what, what do you think I should do? He's like, well, look, just, he's like, just you got all the documentation it's in there he's he's like you know if if they come in with a a lawsuit just you know just let hand it over to me he goes like but right now we've got i think we have a pretty solid case it's in the lease and everything so uh the guy still hasn't paid the the the, the rent it's now about a month later and he says oh yeah so now the next month's rent coming up hey my i'm trying to let you know my father-in-law he he died so now, yeah, he's dead. So he died. And now he's thinking because from his injuries. So now I'm really feeling bad. Now I'm like, I call my attorney. I'm like, look, we got a situation. He's like, look, you still have to act. You can't go sit there and, and, and offer anything because it's in the lease and they're not asking for anything yet. So what you need to do is go through with your procedures. You have to go and serve, you know, your five day notice and let's get this eviction going. And 
and we'll see what happens. So I went to the house to personally serve the five day notice and you'll never guess who answered the door. <laughs> is dad back from the dead like Lazarus himself? I said, this is the greatest miracle that's uh, happened in 2000 years. And this is like, as unbelievable. So I said, this is, you know, it's, it's and I'm like, I couldn't believe it. Now, right away, his son-in-law, you know, was right there. came out. Hey, no, I never said, it. I said it was my other dad. I said, well, you, you're, <laughs> it's like, uh, so like, yes. Hey, dad, you got dude. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> long story short, that was, that was definitely the craziest moment I've ever been through as a, property manager. And I realized at that point in time that, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was crazy. So that was, that was by far the craziest, but I also had one where, you know, I had a guy who, who decided he wanted to move out and he left his dog in the place. And so I'm like, you know, what am I, I got this dog here. And so I'd go over there and I'd feed the dog and let the dog yeah, out. Like, I'm like, abandoned, well, like he took all his stuff and left the dog, left the dog. So, you know, good thing my parents, they had just lost their dog and they were looking for it. And this dog, I, my, I said, Hey, what do you think? And they took the dog in and, and the dog lived a happy life with my parents. But that was, oh, I mean, people I do crazy stuff. Daddy for that. Yeah. yeah. So good. it was a happy ending. But I'll tell you, that was, that was absolutely crazy. And another crazy story that I've had to deal with as a, uh, as, as a. I would owner. say, I think there's a special place in hell for anybody that would walk off and leave an animal that depends on them. That's even worse than lying about a coma and death. Although, Frankly, Joe, you should have checked the obituaries. I'm just going to have to fault you on not looking at the obituaries to see if the death was real. So just, you know, did you learn that, that lesson the hard way? I, I did. And also, also always ask, where can I send, what hospital can I send flowers to? That's, you'll, you'll like know, that. you'll know very quickly where, <laughs> if they're there or not. So. And actually that could be a great in, interview question. If you are an investor who's trying to get a good property manager, ask them, how do they investigate made up stories without just flat out calling the tenant a liar because you and I both know if you call them names, they're never going to pay. But that's a great way to investigate your professionals. And I'm always a fan of interviewing the people that you hire so that you know how they're going to maintain and look after your properties. I hire a property manager because like you, I do not want to be prone to their shenanigans and I'll fall for that shit. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I act all tough. I'm not tough. I'm weak as hell, but I have property managers that are not, they are very tough. And so when you look at those situations, what does it teach you about being an investor? So you're still an active investor. And in fact, you're filming this today in one of your empty vacant properties. What would you say is the number one thing you wish you'd known them that you know now, besides you should have hired a full team of professionals to back you up? The number one thing, and I, I played Monday morning quarterback on this for years. So I know exactly what I would do differently. The number one thing was is, it's the cash flow has to make sense. So back then I was buying properties because the appreciation was going up. As you know, Lee, during that time, 2004, 2005, 2006, the, 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 the appreciation was going up so much. I, you get, you get double digit appreciation. So I look at it like, okay, if I'm only making a hundred dollar positive cash flow per month on this property, that's okay because I'm getting a 10% return on my investment. So I'm okay with if I, at the end of the day, if I break even or even to lose a little bit because I'm gaining so much on this, property value. Well, when the property values tank and you're still only getting hundred dollars a month, positive cash flow, one vacant month with that property, you've already lost money for the year. And if anything goes wrong with that house, you've lost money. So what I would say is you need to have a system in place knowing that, okay, this is what my cash flow is going to be every month. My positive cash flow after my mortgage, after my insurance, you know, after any type of HOA or anything I have to pay. And then also putting it, so I have enough money to put into reserve, knowing that if something goes wrong, I got cash to be able to cover that. And it's just, it has to make sense because if it doesn't and something does go wrong, that's when you start getting in trouble. And the more properties you have, the more this snowballs. So that was, to, to me, was the, was the biggest mistake that I, that I had made was that when those property values did go down, I now didn't have that to sit back on. And now, I, and I couldn't sell the properties. It was like, it was so hard because the, the properties weren't worth what, what, I, what I owed on them. And so I couldn't sell them. I couldn't do short sales on them. And I'm getting money, the, the cash flow I'm getting every month, it was not enough to cover it. So I'm actually literally writing checks every month to cover everything. So that was a very hard lesson to learn. Had I, had I done it the way with, with having the positive cash flow controls in place, I probably wouldn't have had as many properties, which I, I would have been good. And looking at it short term, you say, oh, I wish I had more. No, now looking back, it's like I, I would have rather had, instead of having 18 properties, I wish I would have had five that gave me $500 or $600 a month positive cash flow because I would have been definitely much better off after that. So that was the biggest, the biggest thing I would do differently 
um, looking back. Well, and your one thing has two things to unpack in it. The first one is that you do have to have that slush fund for maintenance on your rental houses because in most states and y'all, whether you're investing or thinking about investing or you represent investors or whatever your relationship is to the market, you need to know your state regulations and statutes because tenant landlord law is entirely different than your typical realtor law. And so you'll have to figure out what you have to do in the way of repairs and maintenance. Some of the tenant requests are going to be time sensitive. So Joe's in Louisiana, I'm in North Carolina. If we have a tenant whose house has an issue in July with the air conditioner and they have a newborn, you better get after it right quick or you're going to be in major hot water, but you better have a slush fund available to handle that. And so you want to set that up. But the second thing that you mentioned was counting on the equity. And of course, at the time that we're recording this, prices are escalating all over the country, except in the middle of certain urban areas where there's been some unrest. We're seeing some issues in those particular markets, but on the balance, real estate is growing really quickly price-wise. So you need to talk to your realtor about that spreadsheet. And anybody doing investments should be operating off a spreadsheet so you can evaluate that monthly cash flow and how you've got your liquid reserves set up, and then what happens if the value falls, which means you also wanna know what the other rental things are happening in your area. If you're buying single family investments, you better know what apartments are charging. If you're buying duplexes and quads and other similar multifamily, you need to know what the corporate apartments are charging because your competition will react to the market when the markets shift. And if you're a small mom and pop, you're not immune to what your competitors are doing just because you're in rental properties. And so you, you gave us a whole bunch of advice in that one little thing. And so I have to ask you, what are you buying now? Are you buying right now with the market going up as we just talked about? Or are you sitting back waiting for the next cyclical change? Yeah, that's a great point. I, it's one of those things where, you know, are we ever going to are we going to see a, a, a recession like we did before? I, I don't know. I think there's some controls that are in place. When I when I bought when I bought this property, so I was living in Illinois. I've owned this property for 12 years. I was I was living in Illinois, and so I was doing it. I actually had a friend that actually said, "Hey, I want to I want you to show me how to do this." Uh, so I went down I went down to Louisiana for two days. I brought my assistant with me. We spent a day showing them how to find foreclosures. Then we went out and looked at some properties. And within one day, we went to 10 houses, three people called us back and, and said, we want to work with you. So I, I was back in Illinois at that time. I said, hey, here's what we have. The options are the numbers look great on these properties. And I said, I'll give you an option. Number one, you can buy them yourself because, you know, you paid me to come down. Number two is that I'll go in with you together on them or three. If you don't want them, I'll take them. And he said, oh, you can have this one. I took it. And it's been the best property I've had for 12 years. Best cash flow. So I live in Florida now, actually. So I, I'm looking. So here, I'm just here. I was doing some work on this property. We're getting it rented out. I'm definitely looking for something. Uh, I'm still actively looking for investment. Now, I think that doing it in, in, in where I am, uh, close to Miami, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. The prices are really high. But I just saw this article about, especially for vacation rent, because that's the other thing. A lot of people say, vacation rental. Do I do that? Do I do this? If you have a good team in place, and I've had a great property manager with this property in Louisiana where I, I've never even met most of the tenants who've come in here and I get a check every month. Yeah, it's been great for 12 years and, uh, you know, properties paid in full. What I'm, I'm still looking, but I just, it, 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 the numbers have to make sense. So when I look at the numbers, what can I get for rent uh, versus what's what, what my down payment going to be? If the numbers make sense and I know it's going to be, it, 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 there's a po good positive cash flow coming out of it, I, I would do it. If, if the numbers, if I'm, if I'm getting in a situation like I was before where, I, hey, the cash flow is not that great, but look at the appreciation going up pretty high. I've, learned, I've, I've been through that before. I'm not going to do that again. So the, the numbers have to make sense because if there was a situation that came out uh, where, you know, the market did slow down and all of a sudden the, the demand goes down, if, if, if I know that the, rental, the, the rents are still going to be able to sustain my, pay my mortgage, give me a positive cash flow, then, then I would do it. Um, and just following the rules of location, 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 extremely important because, you know, there's certain areas where you know you can go where there's, you have a great job market. It's a real strong, you know, people, a strong job market. People want to be there. The tourism industry is still pretty decent. I'm, I'm, that's where I want to be so that I know that's, yeah. North Carolina, <laughs> Florida, Texas, those are your top three states. And there's a yeah. lot of reasons for that. And you and I represent two of them. So we're like covered there. All right, Joe, so our audience, would probably like to know about this book that you recently released that's just knocking the cover off the ball. So give them the quick 20 second spiel on it. And friends, 
don't worry. All the links are in the show notes for the episodes. So you don't have to feverishly write anything down. Just listen to Joe for a second and just click on the notes. So Joe, tell them about what the book is and what they yeah. can get. Well, first of all, Lee, I want to say that, uh, tell the audience that you're one of only two people in this book that have been in both of editions of my book. So Secrets of Top Selling Agents, this is a whole new version, completely different guests with the exception, of course, of Lee Brown, because their content is always amazing. So so again, thank you again for, for that. But yeah, what we did was we, we have a, a monthly webinar program and we have guests that have come on over the years and they talk about all t- kinds of things, everything from real estate investment to building a team to looking for the best deals in, you know, in, in, in real estate, um, everything from mindset, best habits. So we, I take these, the, my favorite episodes, what I call the meat and potatoes of my favorite episodes. And I say, hey, rather than watching uh, you know, 15 one hour episodes, 15 hours, you know, put dedicated 15, read my book. I take, I'll put 15 chapters in there of my favorite episodes. And so every, every chapter is a different episode of this webinar. And it really just talks about it, it, This one covers four different or five different things. One is, is your habits and mindsets uh, of super producer uh, agents, but again, these can apply to any industry, any business. Uh, two is building your team, which is what your chapter is all about, which is great. Uh, three is real estate investment that talks about everything from buying from a, with a 401k to, 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 uh, to just how to uh, have a set of retirement plan, building real estate. The fourth one is using social media. So we do some really good, good chapters on, on, on that as well. And then, and then the fifth one, the fifth one was an interesting take is it's really about like how to run, run, running a business. So we talk about scripts, dialogues, um, things like that. And so it's, it's really got some really good angles to, to the book. But my goal when I, when I wrote this book was to have, if you read the entire book, it, it covers a different aspect of real estate. So when, by the time you're done with it, you've really got a well-rounded idea of, of the business itself. Which means that if you are listening to or watching this podcast and you're thinking about real estate, it's a great book that can help you know more about how the business works and how to set yourself up for success. Or maybe it'll tell you, you don't really want to do this and either way is fine. Or if you're a consumer who hangs out on my podcast, I would actually think about picking up a book like this to tell you how to interview for your next agent. You might then know to what do they mean when they have a team? What is it? What are they doing on social media? So they're not just going to say, I advertise it on Facebook. And then they go make a post about, you know, Hey, I listed a house today, which is not advertising. So anyway, think about it as a resource tool for yourself. And of course, for you existing realtors, you totally want to pick it up because a lot of the nuggets in it, I mean, not just mine, but I've learned a lot from the different sections, things that we're incorporating into our business, because the best thing about real estate is it's different every day. And the crazy shit is not limited to client interactions. It's also interacted to, oh, I could be doing this better. And this is crazy. So crazy can be good. So Joe, thank you for coming on the podcast and giving us some background on your investment life. And thank you for investing your time in drawing realtors together so they can put some great information back out into the space to make the client experience better. I appreciate what you're doing. Thanks again, Lee. Thank you very much. All right, guys, go pick up his book. The link is in the notes for this podcast. And if you have any stories you want to tell because you think you're far more interesting than Joe, then hit me up on the social network to be featured in a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe. I need five stars and I'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time.